This is Glow in the Dark Radio. 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 The Science Fiction Podcast with original independent science fiction written and performed by Mike Luoma with music by Kevin McLeod the Vatican Assassin Trilogy and the Adventures of Alibi Jones by Mike Luoma are available in ebook, trade paperback and audiobook wherever you find your books online get links and details at glowinthedarkradio.com This is the Science Fiction Podcast, Glow in the Dark Radio. I'm your host, your writer and reader, Mike Luoma, and I have Chapter 13, Part 5 of 5 on this episode. This has been an extremely long Chapter 13 of Vatican Ambassador, but we have finally reached Part 5 of 5. BC, our Vatican Ambassador, learned about the project and how this secret group has traveled beyond Mars and onto other star systems. They've set up outposts and met aliens, and now one of those alien races is apparently responsible for a plague, which may be killing off humankind. Long thought dead, founder of the project, Von Kilner, is actually still alive and living out on a secret asteroid base. B.C. is there now, and he's about to meet Von Kilner in Part 5 of Chapter 13 of Vatican Ambassador, coming up on Glow in the Dark Radio. A big thank you to my patrons who help keep this going. If you're a patron, thank you, because you are helping me pay my bills, keep fuel in the tank, keep the lights on, whatever you want to use as your metaphor— You help me keep things going, and I appreciate that. So a big thank you once again to patrons. If you want to become a patron and help support the podcast, you can pledge $2, $5, or $10 a month, and you can do so through Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Patreon.com slash GlowInTheDarkRadio is the place to go for this podcast, or just go to GlowInTheDarkRadio.com or MikeLuoma.com and click on the link for Patreon. And make a pledge and help support the podcast if you can. That's great. And again, thank you for already doing it for those who are patrons. The October giveaway is over as we are now into the month of November. So we had a few people take advantage of getting that free PDF graphic novel, the PDF of Vatican Assassin, the graphic novel. So thank you for picking that up if you did. As I mentioned last week, there's a new Ancient Stone Mysteries of New England calendar out. So you can get that at my ancientstonemysteries.com. New calendar for 2024 with some of the black and white pictures that are in the book, in the paperback, now appearing in color in the calendar. Speaking of appearing, I'm going to be appearing virtually anyway at the Goodnow Library coming up. On the 15th of this month of November, it's a Zoom presentation for the Good Now Library on my Ancient Stone Mysteries of New England. It's nice to be getting asked to appear at libraries and talk about what I've been writing about. It'd be nice if they were asking me to talk about my science fiction, too, but at least at this point, getting some interest, which is nice. And again, that is the 15th of November which is a Wednesday. It'll be at 7 p.m. If you want more information, there's a link in the show notes or go to goodnowlibrary.org and click on their schedule. That's it for book news. So let's get into the final section. The final part of chapter 13, part five of five is on the way next on Glow in the Dark Radio. (laughs) 
the Flash Pulp Podcast. Three to ten minutes of fiction brought to you thrice weekly. Now it's three, three, three apocalypses in one. Yeah! Suffering from tough, stuck-on humans? Well, 20 hellish hours of suffocation in the all-encompassing web of Carwick the Spider God will get them right out. Too many brains lying around? The ravenous mouths surrounding zombie-fighting Ruby will quickly clean those up. Nosy neighbors? Infect them with the murder plague and watch as they dissolve into paranoid maniacs bent on the preemptive assassination of their friends and family. Why stop at one end of the world when you can have all three? You can find them all at flashpulp.com or search for them on iTunes. Now here's Vatican Ambassador Chapter 13, Part 5 of 5, on Glow in the Dark Radio. Anita stops by the next morning to lead the way. She and BC walk through the residential section, through what appears to be manufacturing and labs. They exit the labs and begin walking down a featureless corridor, which then leads on to another long corridor, followed by a third hundred-yard length. Anita and B.C. walked down one long connecting corridor after another. Corridor after corridor? We have to have walked at least six miles. You know, you'd think since you folks can travel to distant stars and faraway planets, you at least might make it easier to get from place to place in your own facility, B.C. grouses. Then Kilner doesn't like to be too accessible, even to those in the project, Anita explains. So we walk. The corridor ends. They turn and start down still another. Another turn, another corridor. No windows, no doors, no other branching corridors, just a long tunnel of connecting corridors winding through the asteroid. Finally, they arrive at a blank gray wall. No apparent door, no apparent controls. Here, hold on a sec, Anita says. Where am I going to go? BC asks. Shh, she shusses him. Dr. Van Kilner, it's Anita Capituna. I've brought Bernard Campion, the Vatican ambassador, with me, as you requested, she says in a loud voice. She and B.C. wait in silence. B.C. begins to speak. She cuts him off with a quick shh and a flail of her arm and a look that could boil blood. He stays silent. They wait in silence for what seems like a long time. It's been, what, two minutes, really? What's this guy's deal? Eccentric old bat, no doubt. The outline of a door appears in the blank wall and then slides silently aside. Come in a voice says. Anita walks through the door. B.C. follows cautiously behind her. Whoa! B.C. is stunned. Stepping through the doorway into Van Kilner's quarters is like stepping into another world. Light brown wood-paneled walls and a brown cream-and-white marble floor replace the grays and whites of the endless corridors. Stained glass windows, backlit by hidden golden lighting, line the walls of the foyer, casting multicolored shafts of light across the floor and across B.C. and Anita as they walk through. B.C. marvels at the artwork, the mosaics of cut colored glass in the windows. Each depicts a different subject, Earth on a field of stars, the landscape of an unknown planet, with two moons rising above the horizon, ships in combat in space, a vast field of asteroids, a bright red nebula, a cool blue spiral galaxy. Each window is a work of art. Most depict scenes and places B.C. has never seen before. Whoa! B.C. lets out an involuntary gasp. The gravity eases as they advance further in to Van Kilner's quarters, lessening its grip. B.C. suddenly feels pounds lighter, and there's an extra spring in his step. He keeps the gravity at about a quarter of Earth normal, Anita explains, noticing B.C.'s surprise. Helps him keep healthy. He's old, she says haltingly. We're expected. We'll meet him in the Arboretum. The Arboretum? B.C. asks. It's where Van Kilner takes his visits with his guests. It's just ahead on the right. B.C. follows her a short way down the corridor. She places her palm flat against the wall, and a door appears. After a minute, the door opens. The smell of damp wood, wet leaves, and fresh loam washes over B.C. Mmm, smells like earth, B.C. says. 
You can see why it's the old man's favorite place, Anita agrees. The Arboretum isn't like any on Earth, though. Van Kilner's taken advantage of the light gravity. Trees and plants grow up from the ground, out from the walls, and down from the distant ceiling, somewhere far above. Trees, plants, and vines interweave overhead, creating a dense canopy that makes it impossible to judge just how high the roof of the Arboretum is. Light sources abound, placed to feed the forest with photonic goodness. Birds? B.C. asks, as he hears chirping off in the distance. Birds, and bugs too. No real pesky insects, just useful ones. Just us useful bugs, B.C. comments. At least you're useful, B.C. hears come from behind him. He turns to see the legendary Dr. Van Kilner floating in a chair hovering two feet off the ground. He's still recognizable from all the news coverage of thirty years ago, but he shows the years and the lines in his face and the stoop of his back. He looks old, but not ancient. Smaller than I thought he'd be. He's one of the giants of history. Guess you kind of expect someone like that to be, I don't know, bigger? Go ahead, say it, Van Kilner says with a chuckle. I know what you're thinking, I hear it all the time. I thought you'd be taller, right? <laughs> he chuckles again. You must be B.C. Hello, Anita. Thank you for bringing him to me. You're welcome, sir. She turns to B.C. B.C., I'd like to introduce Dr. Hans von Kilner. Dr. von Kilner, may I present the Vatican Ambassador to Lunar Prime, Father Bernard Campion. We can call him B.C. Good. Van Kilner extends his hand to B.C. Formalities are done. I think they're important, but I'm always glad when they're over. He and B.C. shake hands. Pretty good grip for a geezer. Vigorous handshake? He's doing well. Or he puts up a good front. You're not as tall as I thought you'd be, Van Kilner says to B.C. You're not as old as I thought you'd be, B.C. counters. Van Kilner laughs. You, I like, Van Kilner says. He smiles at B.C. Walk with me, Van Kilner says. He turns his chair and begins to float away from them down a cleared path among the trees. He stops the chair, turns back to B.C. and Anita. Come on, you two, there's much to discuss. B.C. and Anita catch up to Van Kilner. He leads them down the path. I gather Anita and her crew have filled you in on the project, the aliens, and what's been going on, Van Kilner says as they walk. They have, but B.C. is stopped by a wave of Van Kilner's hand. It's a lot to take in. Van Kilner says to reassure him. I'll say, B.C. blurts out. He composes himself and continues. You folks have been doing a lot without telling the rest of us what's happening. Well, Van Kilner says. He stops his chair and turns to B.C. Can you blame us? Can you imagine us humans, the way we are right now, mounting any kind of defense against powerful alien races? If the humans these aliens meet are from the project, we create a good impression. They're meeting the best and the brightest. Then Kilner turns and smiles at Anita. Aren't they, Anita? Yes, sir. Makes these alien races less likely to take humanity for granted. You see, we serve a purpose. Trust me, if these aliens were in regular contact with the greater mass of humanity, they'd soon be figuring out ways to wipe us all out, like interstellar pest control. Then Kilner clears his throat. <clears throat> Some of us are afraid that might already be happening, he says, his eyes drilling into BCs as he speaks. But, you see, we serve a purpose. Sure you do, B.C. answers without flinching. Don't you love the way it smells in here? Van Kilner says, inhaling a deep breath and changing the subject. Huh? B.C. asks. Lost for a second? Breathe, Van Kilner demands. B.C. breathes. He inhales a deep breath of the earthy, musty, moist air inside the arboretum. Wonder if he's got any psychotropics in the air. Stuff he's used to but would affect me? Soothing, calming agents? Aromatherapy? It does smell good, like being back on Earth, out in the country, after it's rained. Trust me, there are no drugs in the air, B.C., Van Kilner says, noting B.C.'s unease and suspicion. That was weird. Guy almost read my mind. You know, B.C., you project your thoughts rather openly and quite loudly, Van Kilner says. I do? You do, Van Kilner says, answering B.C.'s unspoken thought. Cut that out, B.C. snaps. B.C., Anita cautions. Your own fault, son, Kilner says. I'm not trying to hear you. You just keep broadcasting to me. Keep it to yourself, he admonishes B.C. B.C. tries not to think out loud. Damn. Hard not to do, huh? Van Kilner asks him. Anita's brow is furrowed. 
I don't hear anything, she says, frustrated. You just don't know how to listen, Van Kilner says. You may be hearing more than you know, Van Kilner adds mysteriously. She glares at him. Let's get beyond this, BC suggests. I'm all for that, Van Kilner agrees. Right, Anita says. So, BC looks from Van Kilner to Anita. What's next? You know, Van Kilner says to BC, you're not quite what I expected. I'm not? No, Van Kilner says. I expected someone coarser, I guess. Coarser? BC asks. You're an assassin, Van Kilner explains, matter-of-factly. I thought you'd fit the part. You know, funny thing, I actually haven't killed anybody for a while, BC protests. And it was never by choice. They forced me into it. Who was your last kill? Anita says with some venom. Who was yours? BC spits back at her. Children? Van Kilner upbraids them and takes the conversation back over. Enough of this. We are wasting time. BC, Anita told me what they told you. How much do you remember? What, do you want a summary? BC asks him with some sarcasm. No, Van Kilner chuckles. Not necessary. You obviously know about this base. Van Kilner gestures at his surroundings. Do you know about the Domo? BC nods. The Flays, the Aldred? Van Kilner asks. Yep, BC says, nodding. Our other bases? Heard about them. Not much more. Is there more? Only this. The Eldred have used a plague to wipe out their enemies in the past. We've heard tell of it from some of the other races. It would seem the mellow, quiet race is quite capable of genocide. Why wasn't I told this? Anita asks. Great, BC says sarcastically. Good to know. The Delmo told us that the Eldred wiped out a race on the planet we call Crankshaft centuries ago. Van Kilner elaborates. Anita looks surprised. So, they've done it before? BC asks. They sure have. And the way that the Domo told it, it sounded like it was just something the Eldred, well, do. So, if it's them, BC speculates, how can we prove it's them, and not the UTZ or the UIN? What court could we ever try them in? Here's something I just found out. The plague microbe? It's been found in a place that neither the UTZ nor the UIN had access to. Where's that? BC asks. Here, Van Kilner says, gesturing around them. There's stunned silence between the three of them. Van Kilner breaks it. We found it after it was isolated. When we knew what to look for, more incriminating, the microbe was found in the quarters formerly occupied by our visitor from the Eldred. Actually, there was so little of it, we can't be sure it was actually left with the intent of infecting the whole base. Doesn't really matter now, does it? Van Kilner asks, hypothetically. If we hadn't quarantined the area as soon as we had suspicions, more would have died. People died? Anita asks, suddenly worried. Who? Yes, dear, I'm afraid so. Van Kilner says to her, a couple of the techs. We haven't found a cure for it yet. Oh, she says, just to say something. I know, Van Kilner says with some sympathy. I don't know if you knew them. I'm afraid their names weren't familiar to me, although I hate to lose anyone. Silence hangs in the air between the three of them. This time, B.C. breaks the silence. Why? Why would they try to kill us all? B.C. looks from Anita to Van Kilner. Van Kilner clears his throat to speak. <clears throat> I have no idea, he says. The Domo and the Flays hold the Eldred in near reverence. Act like the Eldred are somehow intergalactic parents. They seem to be a mellow, benevolent caretaker sort of race. They were a little jittery, but they seem mostly old and wise. Watch out for those old and wise ones, eh? BC cracks. <laughs> Van Kilner smiles. Maybe they're so wise, Anita ventures to guess. They decided we were too violent a race to live. She shakes her head. That's all I've got. I don't know, Van Kilner disagrees. The Delmo and the Flays can both be very violent races. Why would the Eldred let them hang around if that was the case? The Eldred have dealt with them for centuries, evidently. You know, BC, Anita says to him, when we first met the Domo, before we knew the Eldred existed, the Domo would talk about those who walked among us. The Flays early on told us about a race they called the Shapers. We think that both the Flays and the Domo were talking about the Eldred. They never said that for sure, but the pieces fit but we aren't sure. Van Kilner nods and then adds, All we know is that all of them have messed with human beings and the earth to one degree or another over the course of our history. The Domo and the Flays have treated the planet Earth like a curiosity. The Domo said that those who walked among us also messed with our planet somehow, centuries ago, Van Kilner says. But they don't and won't elaborate on who those who walked among us were. Really, why won't they talk about the Eldred? BC asks. They usually will. They usually do. That's why we're not positive that those who walked among us are the Eldred. 
We don't know for sure that the Domo meant the Eldred were messing with us in our prehistory. We aren't sure what they had to do with us, if anything. BC tries to get his head around everything Van Kilner's saying. Okay, Anita, Dell, and Chris said that the Domo were like vampires, that they might have inspired some of our legends. They built the original base here, he said, gesturing at the space around them. And the others, the Flays? Anita and Van Kilner nod, BC continues. The Flays left the ruins we found on the moon and Mars and might have been responsible for UFO sightings. But what did the Elder do? We don't know, Van Kilner admits. We just don't know. You can bank on the fact that the Domo were vampires in the 17th and 18th century. They posed as nobility and fed on the local populace in parts of Europe. They studied us, studied Earth, and decided not to take it over. Then they left. The Flays arrived sometime back in the 20th century, about 200 years ago. Most of the UFO craze back then was caused by the Flays, but we have no idea when or even if the Eldred came to Earth. Some of the project's anthropologists think they may have exterminated the Neanderthals, Anita says. Then Kilner gives her a dubious look. It's possible. Still a relatively new theory. But, Van Kilner says with a sense of drama, there is another possibility, and here it gets really interesting. Those who walked among us, and the Shapers, could have been someone else. The Domo made only one mention of them, another race they called Dixapatse, or the Ancient Enemy. They only mentioned them that once, and then never again, Anita says, sounding frustrated. And they definitely didn't mean the Eldred. No, Van Kilner says. The Eldred are not the ancient enemy. But then who is? We've considered some possibilities. The Eldred may work for them. Or somehow they're connected. Maybe the ancient enemy are the ones really behind this plague, eh? There's a possibility, Van Kilner says, introducing a new variable. The Eldred may just do their bidding. It would explain why the other races all hold the Eldred in such respect, if they are the ancient enemy's right hand, and their intergalactic concierge. But the Eldred have not mentioned an ancient enemy at all, not to us. When the Domo mentioned the Dixit Patse, they said that they and the Eldred were on opposing sides in a war a million years ago, Anita says. They could easily have made up in the intervening years. What was the war about? BC asks. We don't know, Anita says. And what about the why? BC asks. Why would any of these races want us dead? How could we be a threat to anyone? Could any of these aliens have allied themselves with the UIN? Anita and Van Kilner exchange an ask-a-stupid-question look between them. Anita answers. None of them could do anything like that without us knowing about it, she assures BC. Damn, they sound awful cocky about that. Especially for people who possibly helped one of those races infect us with the plague. Well, Van Kilner admits, we don't think they could. We know their ships, we know their energy signatures, the trail of particles their engines leave behind. And the Domo and the Flays, at least, know to leave us alone, he chuckles. Plus, none of them, the Eldred included, understand what it is we're fighting about. They don't have religions, not like ours. Really, no religion? BC asks, mystified. None. Not like human beings do. Van Kilner shakes his head. That was why the Eldred wanted to come to Lunar Prime and observe the peace conference. At least that was the reason they said they wanted to attend and observe so they could study our religions further. Further, B.C. asks. Further, Van Kilner confirms. Evidently, the Eldred find our dedication to and obsession with religion to be unique in this universe. And so they've been studying us for a while now. Us and our religions. Heh, <laughs> B.C. laughs. That could be enough to convince any race that we don't deserve to live. Maybe the Eldred and this ancient enemy are our enemies, too. You know, the way the Domo talked about them, Anita says, I don't think that they're around anymore. The Domo spoke of them in very past tense. What do the Flays and the Eldred say about the ancient enemy? The Flays are odd. They don't hold linear conversations, per se, Van Kilner says. They've never mentioned anything about the ancient enemy, and you can't really ask them questions— the Eldred ignored the question completely when we asked them. They acted as if we didn't say anything at all. What do you mean? B.C. asks. They ignored the question, Anita says. They just stared at us, as if we hadn't said anything at all. They waited until we spoke again, and then re-engaged in the conversation. Weird, B.C. observes. It was, Van Kilner agrees. But we dismissed it at the time. Chalked it up to bad translation, miscommunication. Of course, everything's being re-evaluated now. Okay, so maybe we forget about the why, B.C. says. How do we cure this? Can we stop it? You said it showed up here. Have you found a way to cure it? Prevent it? Anything? 
No, Van Kilner says, shaking his head. As I said, people died. But we did isolate the microbe causing the plague, and we're working on it. We did discover one thing. It's apparently not universally fatal. Some people aren't affected, even though they were infected. Not everyone exposed to it catches it. No, BC asks. No, Van Kilner says. As a matter of fact, you were no doubt infected yourself, BC. You just have the good fortune of being immune. You don't have it. Am I a carrier? He asks, worried. We don't know for sure, Van Kilner says. There is no evidence so far that this can be spread by anyone except a sick person. Not that we've seen so far. We just don't know all that much about it yet. We should have you checked out. Do some blood work. What are you, the Flays? BC jokes, getting it deliberately wrong. No, that was the Domo, Anita corrects him. But they don't... I mean, they're not... Oh, never mind, she sighs. BC smiles at his little victory. Very clever, BC, Van Kilner notes. It will be painless. We've got the best doctors here, I promise you, he says to BC. Hell, they've kept me alive this long, he laughs. Anita, why don't you take BC to our infirmary, have them draw some blood, test for the microbes, see if there's some healing factor you have that's unique and fun and different? Then Kilner shifts on his chair. Then I'm afraid I should let you go. There isn't much more to tell you about. I wanted to meet you, see if you were the sort of man I can work with. You are, but I'm afraid they'll be needing you back on Earth, back on the moon at the very least. This plague is bad, BC, and it's spreading through the human population like wildfire. There are a lot of people dying, Van Kilner says. He drops his head, rubs his face. And it's all your fault, BC realizes. Isn't it, both of you? All of you in the project. Your arrogance made you blind to a serious threat, didn't it? He looks from Van Kilner to Anita. Neither says a word. You two are responsible for taking more lives, and certainly more innocent lives, than I ever did in my former career. Anita protests. BC, really? Come on! Wow. BC keeps going. What you've unleashed makes my discretions pale in comparison. This was not intentional, Van Kilner says softly. We are responsible, Anita says. I'm responsible. I'll admit it, even if you can't, doctor. We're killing people. She nods at BC. Sure as he did. We are not murderers. Van Kilner says defensively. Does that matter to the victims? To any of our victims? Anita asks them. The three of them are quiet. There's nothing else to say. A minute passes in silence. We should get going, BC finally says. Get me to the infirmary and then back on my way to the moon, right? Okay? Sure, Anita says, still quiet. Well, Van Kilner says, I guess this is it for now. Think about our next step. We'll keep in touch. It was good to meet you, BC. Even if you did have the unbridled temerity to call me a murderer. He extends his hand. BC shakes it. Thanks, Dr. Van Kilner. I'll do what I can to help you. To help us all stop this thing. So will we. We'll be doing all we can here. Thank you, Doctor, Anita says. She motions to BC to precede her out. They turn, leaving Van Kilner among the trees, as they make their way back to the Arboretum's door. The door shuts silently behind them, disappearing into the wall. It's bad, isn't it? B.C. asks Anita as they walk down the corridor. What? Anita says absentmindedly. The plague? B.C. reminds her. I don't know, she tells him. It sounds like it's bad. Yeah, it does, Anita says. She sounds defeated. Hey, B.C. says, stopping. Anita stops. What? She says, a little exasperated. B.C. looks her in the eye. Look, if anyone can find a cure to this, it's you people, the project. You may have unleashed this plague, but you're the only ones who have even a chance of defeating it. The UTZ scientists are working on it too, but I'll put my money on the project. You? You're trying to cheer me up? Give me a break. She sighs, turns, and sets off back down the corridor. BC follows her back through the long, empty corridors in silence. What I get for trying to be nice. Have it your way, bitch. Jeez. After a quick trip to the infirmary, BC and Anita take off on a flasher for Lunar Prime. B.C. is back on the moon by dinner time. Anita and B.C. disembark from the Flasher in EVA suits and re-enter Lunar Prime the way they left it, through the outbuilding at the edge of the facility. I'll be in touch in the next couple of days, she tells B.C. as he begins to leave the outbuilding and head for home. How can I get in touch with you, he asks her. We'll set that up when I call. Figure out what to do next. It's a lot to digest. I know. Thanks for not killing me. Back in his quarters in the Vatican mission, B.C. turns on the news. It's not good. 
This new sickness, this new plague, is decimating the population on Earth, in orbit, and on the moon, the newscaster says. UTZ officials assure us their finest scientific minds are applying themselves to a search for the cure. Most people wonder if this is the UIN's doing. There is also talk among the scientists that this plague is not of human origin, but may spring from some interstellar source or origin. Theories abound. Some suggest the UIN uncovered the plague among artifacts on Mars and brought it to the peace conference on the moon. But did they do it deliberately, or was it a horrible accident? We'll be speaking with experts on both sides in our next segment. Another theory? Cosmic and infection. Maybe a stray meteor, some hunk of killer ice, carried a deadly cargo to the moon that somehow was introduced into the environment. Or could it be aliens? All we know for sure is that the plague began its wave of destruction on the moon, let loose as representatives gathered to talk peace. In a related story, the sponsor of the conference, Vatican Ambassador Bernard Campion, has reportedly disappeared. There's been no sign of the ambassador, according to our sources, for at least the last two days, although unnamed UTZ officials are saying off the record that Campion is working in secret with them to try to trace the source of the plague and find a cure. Nice. At least someone is making excuses for me. Weird to have someone handling PR for me. I didn't think I would be the news. I'm here. Just took a little trip is all. Should I issue a public statement? What would I say? BC checks his messages. Several of the waiting ones are from the Vatican. Well, all it takes is a genocidal plague to get them to call. Nice. The last four are marked as extremely urgent. The Pope is dead. His Holiness the Pontiff Linus II has died, and the Curia has sent B.C. messages asking B.C. to report to Vatican City. Great. They want me down there yesterday. Guess I better go. So wait, what are these? Next message? A new pope is chosen. Peter the Third. B.C. advances to the message after that, where the last told of the election of a new pope, the next announces that he too has died. Time passes like a freight train, chugging past too fast to see. The last message asks him to report to the Vatican once again. Well, I guess I should get back down to Earth, see if I can do anything at Vatican City. Don't know why I should. No good ever seems to come from helping. That was Chapter 13. The end of Chapter 13. Chapter 13, Part 5. On Glow in the Dark Radio. BC has been summoned to Vatican City. And so he's got to go, and he'll be heading down on our next episode. But he has a lot to process. And, seemingly, he also has some new allies, with Von Kilner and the project, if he can trust them. He's not so sure about that. So, lots to ponder as BC travels down to Vatican City on our next episode of Glow in the Dark Radio. The Very Long Chapter 13 finally at its end. I will caution you, there is at least one more very long chapter coming up. I looked ahead and chapter 18 is about an hour and a half long. Again, I don't know what my younger writing mind was thinking at the time when I designed the length of these chapters, but so be it. We made it through Unlucky 13. <laughs> and BC made it out to the asteroids, to the secret base. A reminder on the book news, I'll be doing a virtual presentation with the Goodnow Library in Sudbury on the 15th of this month of November, Wednesday night, 7 p.m. If you want to find out more, there's a link in the show notes or go to goodnowlibrary.org. There's a new calendar, the Ancient Stone Mysteries of New England calendar for 2024. Which you can find out more about at ancientstonemysteries.com or just follow the link in the show notes. And once again, a big thank you to my patrons. Thank you if you're a patron for helping to support this podcast. And if you want to get in on that, just go to patreon.com slash glow in the dark radio. You can sign up for $2, $5, or 10 bucks a month and help support the podcast. That is all for this week. I'm your host, your writer and reader, Mike Luoma. Thank you again for listening to Glow in the Dark Radio. Glow in the Dark Radio.
This podcast presentation is copyright 2023 by Michael F. Luoma and is protected under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License CC by NCND 4.0 Music by Kevin McLeod You can find his work at Incompetech.com Mike's books are available in ebook, paperback, and audiobook wherever you find books online. Get links and more details at glowinthedarkradio.com and mikeluoma.com. This has been a presentation of Glow in the Dark Radio.